Hello and welcome to the first animal cognition lecture. What I'd like to do first is present you with the outline. There's going to be two parts to this lecture. Um, in the first part we're going to be discussing issues such as what is animal cognition about? Um, what topics are we going to be covering in this course? Uh, what's the goal of animal cognition research? And also why is this research challenging? Um, in the second part of the lecture, we're going to be discussing some historical context for the field, um, including discussing the idea of the great chain of being, which goes back to Aristotle and suggests that there is a, a dramatic discontinuity between animals and humans. Um, then we're going to discuss Descartes' ideas on mental discontinuity that kind of carries on the tradition of Aristotle and says that there is a big difference in the mental lives of animals and humans. And um, then in the last part of the lecture, we're going to be discussing Darwin's ideas on mental continuity. Right? The idea that uh, his idea is that evolution, um, by natural selection, leads you to expect that there should be similarities between humans and animals in terms of their mental lives. So, in the first part, we're going to address the question of what is animal cognition. Right. So, what is this field about? In general, animal cognition is a study of the mental lives of non-human animals. And, um, but it's, it's more specific than that, right? Because there's many questions that one could ask about animal minds. We could ask, for example, about the emotional lives of animals. What emotions do they experience? Do they have the same range of emotional experiences that we do? Uh, a second question we could ask is, are animals conscious? Right? Is there is there a subjective? Do they have subjective states? Is there something that it's like to be an animal, just like there's something that it's like to be us? Right? Certain subjective states. Another question that you might ask about animal minds is: Do they have distinct personalities? Um, obviously, in, in in human psychology, there's lots of research into personality and individual differences, and you could conduct. Uh, and some people do conduct uh, similar research with animals, looking at things like temperament differences between members of the same species. Now, all these questions about emotions, about consciousness, about personality, and so on, uh, those are interesting questions, but they are not the subject matter of, of animal cognition. Right? Animal cognition is concerned with how animals process information. So it's a course on information processing, which is essentially the, the same uh, or, or very similar to courses on human cognition that you may have already taken. All right. So this is going to be a course in cognitive psychology. The only difference is that our focus is going to be on animals, not just on humans. So if you studied animal, uh, or sorry, if you studied human cognition, one of the things that you learned is that humans are bombarded with information, but they can't process all of this information, right? So they have to filter it out. And the same happens with animals, right? Any animal is part of a world where there's tons of information that's impinging upon it, right? Information from lots of different modalities, but obviously it can't process all this information, so their sensory and their perceptual systems filter out a lot of information, right? So that they don't they don't get paralyzed by trying to process everything that's around them. So animals, just like humans, have perceptual systems and sensory systems that guide them to process only certain information in the environment. So some information is perceived. Some information is attended to, analyzed, remembered, and possibly shared with other animals. Right? So many animals communicate with each other, sharing information. As one prominent animal cognition uh, researcher says, animals, like humans, selectively attend to some stimuli. They perceive patterns, store information for future use, and communicate information to other animals. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to be examining in this course. How animals learn, 
um, their ability to remember, right? So what kinds of memory systems do they have? How do they communicate with one another? And can they learn a human-like language? Are animals capable of insightful problem solving and reasoning? Um, we're also going to be discussing how animals navigate through their world, right? what kinds of tools do they have for figuring out where they're going and how to get back to their, to their homes. And towards the end of the course, we're going to be looking at what animals know about the mental lives of other animals. Right? So do they have any kind of insight into what's going on inside the, the minds of their conspecifics? So another important question to address before proceeding is, why do we study animal cognition instead of simply focusing on animal behavior? Right? Animal behavior is something that we can clearly see. So why do we need to delve into the black box to figure out what's going on inside? As you might recall, behaviorists said that all we need to, under, to, to uh, predict animal behavior is knowing what stimuli they were exposed to, whether they were re reinforced and, and punished, uh, and what behaviors they produced. Right? But animal cognition researchers assume that in order to explain and predict uh, animal behavior, we need to examine what they call intervening variables. Variables having to do with what's going on inside the, uh, the mind or brain of the animal. Right, so you can't predict what an animal is going to do and you can't explain it without developing theories that consist of the following information. Right, so we need theories of A, what information is represented in the mind of an animal. Right, so what's it holding inside? How did it gather this information from the environment? Right? How did it perceive it and detect it? And finally, um, what operations it carries out on this information before producing a behavior? Right? So all the stuff that cognitive psychologists talk about. And in illustrating what's involved in animal cognition and some of the challenges, I want to focus on the California ground squirrel. Um, I'm sure you've seen these um, you find on campus, for example. Um, these squirrels are very amazing little creatures, and uh, they encounter many threats to their survival and reproduction as they go about their business. And because of that, they have to have many anti-predator responses, right? They have to find a way of dealing with threats. And one of the most notorious threats to these squirrels is the rattlesnake, right? About 69% of rattlesnake diet in California comes from these squirrels. So rattlesnakes and other snakes are dangerous, but um, squirrels have to find a way of dealing with them, right? And they have to, um, you know, interact with them and, and kind of, um, Put them in their place if they can. Right? So one of the things that you sometimes see, um, one of the behaviors that you see these California squirrels engage in is what's called the tail flicking response. Right? So they often flick their tails at the rattlesnakes, particularly at night. Right? So they'll approach, they'll get fairly close to the rattlesnake, but you know, far enough to not be uh, uh, quickly attacked by them. And then they'll start flicking their tails, right? They'll wave their tails uh, repeatedly. And what happens as they do this is that blood flow to the tail increases. And when you get more blood flow to the tail, the tail gets warmer. And somehow this tricks the snake into thinking that the squirrel is actually bigger than it actually is. So why is that? Well, snakes... Uh, at least at night, uh, they, they tend to rely on infrared sensors located uh, on either side of their head, right? So they have uh, infrared sensors, and these can be fooled by, this, by the squirrel producing this tail flicking response, right? So you can see on the left um, an infrared image of the uh, squirrel when it's flicking its tail. You can see it's much bigger, right? than the image on the right where the, the, where the uh, squirrel is not flicking its tail. And when it looks bigger, 
right? It makes it less likely that the squirrel is going to be attacked by the rattlesnake. And uh, so the snake will will leave it alone and the, and the squirrel will be able to, to go about its business of finding food. Another interesting thing, however, is that this response is unique to rattlesnakes, right? So they don't engage in the tail flicking response to other types of snakes. And the reason for that is that other snakes that they might encounter don't have these infrared sensors. Right, so one of the things that this shows is that many of the signals that animals send to one another may not be detectable with our own perceptual systems. Right, we can't see infrared. To detect infrared, we need special sensors. We need special technology. And this makes animal cognition, this is one of the things that makes animal cognition challenging. Right, because a lot of what's going on in the animal world may be beyond our awareness because our senses are actually very, very limited. Um, so how do they deal with other types of snakes? Well, one of the things that California ground squirrels do is that they mask their scent, right? They hide their own scent by applying the scent of other snakes. So what they do is when they find the snake skins that have been shed by snakes, is they chew them and then they lick their fur. And this covers their fur with the scent of the snakes. Um, other times what they do is they, they'll walk over the ground where other snakes have been and they might roll around in it and, and absorb some of the scent that way. So obviously that would, that would uh, help to make it less likely that they're detected by other squirrels. So the question then is, how do they come to know that licking their fur after chewing snake skins helps to keep snakes away? How do they learn that contingency? Right? Is it simply by trial and error? Did they just stumble upon this, realize that it works, right? the snakes go away or, or stay away, uh, and then they just kept doing it? Or did they make inferences about the minds of snakes? Right, that they reason, if I put sna uh, snake smell on myself, snakes are going to believe that there are other snakes around, not squirrels. And therefore, they'll leave me alone. Right? Is that how they do it? Did they, did they engage in that reasoning process? Another possibility is that it's simply an instinctive response. Right? Over countless millennia, squirrels that engage in this sort of behavior uh, randomly uh, were more likely to survive and reproduce and this instinct just got carried on. So we see here uh, several different possibilities. But obviously these competing explanations differ in important ways. Right? The trial and error account and the instinct account of scent masking doesn't require the squirrel to have any kind of insight into the mental states uh, or what's going on inside the mind of a snake. Right? The account that involves making inferences about what the snake will believe as a result of engaging in the sort of behavior, obviously that one does require some kind of insight into the mental states of the, uh, of the snake. What about in the, kale of, in, in the case of tail flicking? Right? When they flick their tails, are they intentionally trying to deceive the snake into believing that there is a larger animal than is actually there? Right? Is it a case of intentional deception? Or did they simply learn this contingency between tail flicking and rattlesnakes being intimidated? Right? Did they do it by chance and then just uh, get rewarded and just keep making the behavior as a result? So this is one of the lessons so far of this course, right? We're going to see that in animal cognition, Whenever you have some uh, animals engaging in some sort of behavior, there's often many possible explanations for how the animal comes to carry out that behavior in response to some stimulus. So the lesson here is that we have to be careful in, in, in our interpretations of the behavior. And if we want to figure out what actually is going on inside the mind of an animal, we have to construct carefully designed experiments. Right? Only by designing carefully designed experiments 
can we rule out alternative explanations of behaviors? Right? What you can't do is simply assume that animals carry out actions by engaging in exactly the same sorts of mental processes that we would do in similar circumstances. Right? There's different ways of getting at the same behavior. Right? There's different ways of, of doing the same thing in response to a stimulus. And it's only by carrying out very subtle, well-designed experiments and presenting animals with the right uh, conditions that you can figure out what actually is going on.